Berlin, June 1934. Behind the scenes of a bustling capital, there are currents of intrigue. Hitler, faced with a coup by fellow Nazis, will show the insurgents and later all Germans the depth of his resolve to retain power. Various historians agree that somewhere between 200 and 900 rebels, suspects, even the innocent, were massacred. No trial, no jury. How did you feel about that? Did that not give you second thoughts about the man? No, because it was, uh, uh, was Hindenburg who, who was um, okaying the whole action officially, not only uh, in, in private, uh, privately, but he said this was necessary in the, in the interest of the state. And, um, um, uh, and when Hindenburg said this, he was um, uh, old, conservative, and not one of the Nazi party, it meant really very much for the German people, and it meant much to me too. Yeah. Would you have, you would have known that it was illegal, that it was criminal? That it was illegal, I wouldn't have said criminal, I, I would have used the word illegal, uh, but uh, if Hitler would have explained to me the necessity of it, I would have said, well, he's all right. That blood purge of 1934, however shocking it was, would not have been very much of a surprise to anyone who had really taken the trouble to read Hitler's blueprint for the Third Reich. He called it Mein Kampf, my struggle. And this book, which came out in 1925, by 1933, when Hitler was chancellor, had sold a million copies. It became the top book in Germany. It outsold even the Bible. Um, many historians have said that if people had read Mein Kampf with more care in the 30s, they would have seen what he intended to do and would not have been surprised because he does spell it out there. I started to read Mein Kampf, it was so dull, I stopped it. It's all in here. France is the mortal enemy of Germany. There must be expansion to the east. They got living space, Lebensraum, for the German people. That meant Russia. Listen to this. The new Reich must again set itself on the march along the road of the Teutonic Knights of old to obtain by the German sword sod for the German plow and daily bread for the nation. Well, that march of Hitler's began as early as 1935, and it would go on for 10 years. And for a while, it would appear to rival the conquests of Caesar, Napoleon, Alexander. It began slowly, dramatically, a symphony warming up. March 1935, Hitler scrapped the military sections of the Versailles Treaty. Universal military training was restored. Germany will have an army of 36 divisions. One year later, March 1936, the Reichswehr was on the move into the demilitarized zone of the Rhineland. Hitler said, we have no territorial demands to make in Europe. March 1938, Hitler proclaimed the incorporation of Austria into the German Reich. He spoke from Vienna. Czechoslovakia was next. That was easy. Britain and France sold out the Czechs and the Slovaks. Hitler was handed the Sudetenland. It was a hot, sultry August that summer of 1939. Berliners were sullen, suspicious. Ration cards had been issued. Over at the Polish embassy, somebody noticed that the ambassador's bags were packed. After Poland, Denmark was next, then Norway, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, 
France. June 14, 1940, Paris fell. Paris, for Adolf Hitler, was the jewel in the crown of conquest, a treasure to be sabred firsthand. His architect, Albert Speer, would accompany him. We started very early in the morning, and there was almost no people on the street. The street was empty. One just could see a few policemen who saluted uh, Hitler, but uh, I don't know if they even realized whom they saluted. First of all, of course, he went to the Grand Opera. We went up the staircase, we went through the hall, and he admired this building. He told me that this is the most wonderful opera of the world, and um, said, but that we in Berlin should try to surpass it. To the, to, um, to the tour die fell, and um, a long time he was uh, admiring the um, Eiffel Tower as one of the greatest designs of an engineer of the end of the 19th century, which really it is. And from there to the Dome d'Invalid, where he was standing opposite the tomb of Napoleon. In so far as I could see, this moment was the most touching for him. He was silent, nobody of us dared to speak. He was full of praise of what he had seen, and again said, uh, what a wonderful day it was, I shall never forget it. And it's one of the highlights of my whole life. But, he said, Speer, I once thought to destroy Paris because it's so beautiful is always a competition to us. But now uh, I think we do a better job. We will build Berlin in a way that Paris will be surpassed. Back in Germany, Hitler's architect pushed ahead with his plans for the new Berlin, with an occasional break from the blueprints. At this point in Speer's life, he was at the top of his architectural career. In the spring of 1941, the skiing was good, but the news was bad. Hitler's deputy, Rudolf Hess, had fled to the enemy. What uh, signs, if any, of his instability did you see in the early days? Well, I saw him uh, not very often. When I saw him, he was quite a, a modest man compared with those others who were uh, liking a very uh, a s a splendid life. and. Um, he was interested, for instance, in chamber music. Others wanted the big operas to hear Wagner and so. Mm. Did he ever feel, do you think, later that he had been pretty naive in thinking he might be able to bring about peace by flying to England? No, I think he is proud of this achievement still and uh, thinks uh, that uh, he could have succeeded uh, if, um, the, if the others would have seen the end of the whole war. You mean the other would, leaders in Germany? No, the leaders in England. It's well known that really Hitler wanted to have peace with England, with the United kind Kingdom, but under his conditions, and his conditions were that he is guaranteeing the empire with the German armed forces, and on the other hand that the British give him free hand and on the continent. Mm -hmm. And if he would have succeeded, I'm convinced that uh, Hess would have been received by Hitler as a great hero, hero of Germany. A month later, Hitler turned his back on England and looked east to Russia. June 1941, a summer of triumph. By December, advanced German army units have reached the suburbs of Moscow. They would never get any further east. 
It was the beginning of a new year, the beginning of the end. Besides the setback on the Russian front, Hitler's Minister of Armaments, Dr. Fritz Toch, was killed in a plane crash. The Fuhrer turned to his architect. When uh, Hitler nominated me as uh, Minister of Armaments, the first thing what I wanted him to promise me, and he did, was uh, that when the war is over, I can go back in my job as architect. And I told Hitler that I, I'm not able to do it, but Hitler said, I have nobody else, you should, you, you must do it. With his compulsion for work, Albert Speer soon surpassed the output of his dead predecessor. Increased production was colossal. In a very short time, I had an organization of about eight or 10,000 industrialists and technicians who were handling the whole thing to the last detail. And this worked fine, you know, and this change made the increase of production. It was not me who did it. I had just the idea. I tried to get as much experience as possible, and, and I was on the, on the test fields, and, um, um, and it was, well, it was uh, some kind of relaxation, I must confess. Mm -hmm. After all the worries I had in my office to be now somewhere, uh, somewhere and to make tests, which that was just uh, good fun. But Speer quickly realized that increased production quotas for torpedoes and submarines were dependent on the labor force. And he told a man named Fritz Zaukel that more workers were needed. That was an order that would haunt Speer to this day. You, as the head of the armaments program, have also been accused of being responsible for the slave labor program, the importation of millions of people from other countries and they're being forced to work under hideous conditions to produce German armaments. That is not true, but always is uh, told that I was a boss of the slave laborers. I wasn't because we have had in Germany um, a few million slave laborers and only about, not only, but 30% of them were working in my factories and the others were working in other fields which were not uh, in my responsibility. This fact was dealt thoroughly in the, during the Nuremberg trial, and um, I was uh, saying that I am feel responsible for um, that I ordered um, from a Saugel, who was a plenipotentiary for working, for, for workers, labor. for labor, uh, as much workmen which were coming to Germany against their own will, um, and that I am responsible for it. But um, there was no doubt during the whole trial that the man who was responsible for slave labor, for their nourishment, for their, um, for their clothes, for, their, uh, for the barracks where they were living in, and for coming to Germany was Saugel himself. But you must have known about the conditions under which these people worked, and you were in a position to act on their behalf. You could have insisted that the conditions, the food, clothing, were this, improved. This was, uh, even when I was not responsible, we, that means industrialists and my ministry, mm -hmm. felt uh, that it's necessary to have enough clothing, to have uh, sufficient nourishment, and there was enough proof in New during Nuremberg trial, which led to another sentence in my judgment, that I was succeeding in giving the workmen, the, well, the deported workmen, better food and better working conditions. As early as 1942, Albert Speer doubted the ability of Germany to win. Nevertheless, he continued to rally his vast organization to produce the weapons of war almost to the very end. Why did you commit yourself so thoroughly to still maintaining as high a level of armaments production as you possibly could? Would the war not have, have been shortened if armaments production had been limited? 
that is one of the, um, of the biggest reproaches to my activities, yeah. that I prolongated the war possibly with my activities for one or two years. And um, uh, of course, that is, that is the truth. It was um, not with me only, but with my whole organization, they prolongated it. But also then, this uh, whole um, uh, fight to, s to the end, to 45, gets in some way, possibly some sense. Uh, Wedemeyer, the chief of staff of the Americans for a while, he wrote just a hint, was, is not very much in his memoirs, that he is afraid of a collapse of the German troops in 42. Because uh, if Germany would have collapsed in 42 or in 43, you weren't ready. And uh, Russians would have infiltrated in Europe certainly much more than they did than in 45. June 6th, 1944. They called the beaches Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. It was the mightiest combat force assembled in the history of the Western world. Americans, British, Canadians. The orders were direct, if not simple. You will enter the continent of Europe, and in conjunction with the other allied nations, undertake operations aimed at the heart of Germany and the destruction of her armed forces. It was a curious fact of this war how tenaciously the retreating German army fought back, but the onslaught was too much. River by river, the Allies advanced across the Seine, the Marne, the Meuse, and finally the Rhine. The Americans crossed it, the first army since Napoleon. From the east, an avenging Red Army rose from the ashes of Stalingrad, rolled across Belarusia to the River Elba. Hitler his armies long since reduced to ragged remnants in Africa and Russia, ordered the sons, even the fathers of his vanquished army, to defend the homeland, to the last man. And if that was not possible, and Hitler knew it, he ordered his architect, his minister of war armaments, to destroy Germany. Nothing would be left for the victors. And he said to me, no, you are not right. The German people has no right to survive. I will destroy everything. And he gave orders uh, to destroy the industry, to destroy the water plants, plants, to destroy the electric power stations, and so on and so on. It would have meant um, the end of civilized life in Germany for quite a long time. This peaceful and prosperous scene bears very little resemblance to the Germany at the end of the war. Speer realized that Hitler's scorched earth policy was monstrous. And so he set out on one of the most bizarre journeys of his spectacular career, following a calculated plan to see that Hitler's orders were disobeyed. I must see quite many of the Gau leaders, of the political leaders of Hitler, uh, saw that it is nonsense in this situation to do such a thing. And uh, so I went around in uh, West and East Germany. In East Germany we prevented the destruction too, and in Poland too. And um, uh, to convince them that the war is lost, there's no more any chance. It's madness, Speer noted, as he sped around the countryside, countermanding Hitler's orders. And one of the strangest aspects in the drama was Speer's inexplicable affection for his Fuhrer. He returned to a besieged Berlin to say goodbye to Adolf Hitler. And I flew back to him to say farewell to him. It was craziness, but this craziness was a part of the influence he still had on me. 
Towards the end, one of Hitler's generals said, it's strange that the man who commanded armies from the deserts of Africa to the Caucasus of Russia should be living in a hole in the ground like a rat. And that's where it was. That's the site of Hitler's bunker, that mound of grass in East Berlin. Like the Berghof, nothing of it exists. And that, too, is where Speer's marbled and mirrored hallways in the chancellery were. And Speer tells us that he came here once to kill Hitler. There was a ventilator that stuck up above the ground. He thought he could pour poison gas down it. But by the time his plan matured, the ventilator had been put under guard. It was a bizarre scene in that bunker in those final days of April 1945. Hitler there ordering armies around that didn't even exist. A pathetic staff preparing for the end, anesthetized with champagne. And Albert Speer was one of the last men to see Hitler alive. And Hitler himself, he um, was deteriorating too in his um, in his, uh, his clothes were, were smudged with stains and uh, nobody cared about to, to clean them and um, he was, um, he looked miserable, he looked like a, like a very old man, he aged for years, years and years in, in a few weeks. The Third Reich ended as it had begun with violence and horror. Hitler and Eva Braun killed themselves. A few days before the death of Hitler and of her, she was quite amiable to me, and uh, I had a longer chat, and she, and then I really started to admire her because, in my opinion, in this bunker, she was the only reasonable human being. Mm. The others? Joseph Goebbels would kill himself, his wife, and their six children. He, he was a fanatic. It's typical for him that he had such an idea. Uh, I never understood that Frau Goebbels was so subdued to her husband because she had no reason, she had no reason because she betrayed her, he betrayed her uh, very often, he was not a faithful companion of her life, uh, but she just uh, said, well, well, that is how it shall be. Overhead, the skies of Berlin were streaked with gunfire. The city's fate was sealed. In every quarter, the Red Army swarmed through the streets. For Albert Speer, it was time to leave. When I was in the Chancellor and I had said um, farewell to Hitler, and I was then alone, I went in the uh, court of honor, which I had built in 38. One heard the gunfire now and then. And there I said uh, farewell to my uh, to my main work as an architect. And um, this was the end of what I thought was my productive life. Mm -hmm. In those final days, this stretch of the road between the Brandenburg Gate and the Victory Monument had to serve as the only airstrip available to the bunker headquarters. Speer's plane had landed here. After he came out from the chancellery, he climbed back into the little Fiesler Stork, which is a, an early version of an STOL airplane and took off in this direction, just creeping into the sky and barely missing the Victory Monument as they went by. It was quite a sight because um, one could see all around Berlin the, the gunfire of the, of the Russian artillery and, um, and now it was dawning and we saw now and then Russian fighters around. So we were, we were going very low in, a low, in a low flight, just a few meters over the ground. And what was uh, now by coincidence, we were just flying along those lakes where I was doing my honeymoon with my kayaks with my, uh, and with a tent many, many years before. The Platz der Republik, April the 30th. The red flag flying over the Reichstag. The Battle of Berlin was over. Ahead for Albert Speer, an uncertain future. In the end, the top Nazis all came back here to Nuremberg, the city where their fantastic rallies had given the movement so much of its original myth and energy. 
twenty one of them stood in the dock in the palace of justice accused war criminals of the twenty one only spare pleaded guilty thirteen went to the gallows including zirkel the man who brought slave laborers to germany the obese gearing cheated the hangman he took poison the others all got prison sentences spare for twenty years he was just forty years old and thus began a world inquest into the personality of the devil's architect which continues to this day and mr spare you came from a professional family you were university trained yourself you're a man who wrote two philosophically and psychologically subtle books of memoirs the history of the your experience in the third reich and your diary from spandau and one of the great puzzles about you to anyone interested in you in that period is how a man of that kind of subtlety could have been seduced by nazi policy and, and could have associated with that gang of offensive thug like people you must be uh, quite aware that this man who wrote the books can't be compared with this man who was living until uh, spring 45 because in those 20 years in Spandau the first time in my life I could occupy my mind with everything with which in our world is um, valuable in literature not only the all the novels and um, but also some um, books of of psychoanalysts from Freud, Adler, Jung and so on and the book of historians and biographies of important people and this enabled me to see the whole thing from another point of view so if uh, it's not justified to say how this man Speer, who wrote those books, was able um, to follow Hitler, because it's another man. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, uh, power is sweet, and to gain power and to possess power, to send to to leave it, is. Uh, is very difficult and one sees this in politics with old politicians like de Gaulle and Adenauer so even they were wise people but they suffered from the same uh, mental um, illness. Speer served his sentence to the day here at Berlin's Spandau prison and as I stand here Rudolf Hess is still inside 36 years after his famous flight to Britain Speer's sentence ended in 1966, his release coming in the dead of night. In a nearby hotel, the press waited. After 20 years, the puzzle of Albert Speer was still unsolved. Ten years later, Speer went back to that hotel with me. We talked first of Spandau's last prisoner, the strange Rudolf Hess. Would he be capable of surviving if, by some miracle, he was released now at the age of 82 or 83? I'm sure he would, uh, because his family is intact, too. And this is the main thing. And uh, I know where he would live, in the mountains. And there is his room already prepared for him. The popular opinion of Hess, I think, in, uh, in uh, North America is that he is crazy. Is he crazy? Not at all, in my opinion. And uh, he was checked so often by uh, psychoanalysts of the armies of the French and American, British and Russian during his Spandau time. And all the reports were saying that he is not insane. And this was our opinion too. But he still believes that everything that the Third Reich did was correct and that Hitler was the world's greatest leader. Uh, well, that's his, um, um, he is still, uh, mesmerized or, or convinced of Hitler and I think this gives him a support to stay in the conviction that uh, Hitler is the greatest man of Europe or he doesn't say Hitler, he says the Führer is the greatest man of Europe 
and um, to um, go on with his being now the deputy of Hitler. Speer has tried without success to visit Hess in Spandau, but he's been back to the prison only once for this film. I remember from the diaries you're reading the report of a British Royal Commission on Crime and Punishment, which said after nine years in prison, a person is permanently damaged. At that point, you had been in prison 11 years. Did you feel that you had been permanently changed? Uh, there was no damage done to me. I passed a very thorough medical examination by the professor for internal um, in um, Heidelberg University. And all his assistant professors they were doing some curious things. And uh, the result was that uh, the professor said, you, with your 20 years of prison, you are a medical miracle to me because you, nothing is wrong with you. Did that include psychological and neurological testing? No, not. I didn't need it, I thought. When we talked in your home in Heidelberg a month ago, and you described your background and your education, the romanticism of the boy exploring the ruins in Heidelberg, the effect of the First World War, the humiliation of the Versailles Treaty, the, the technical uh, narrowness of your education and the stress on obedience and loyalty throughout all of your formation as a human being. You seem to me to be saying, these were the conditions that made me what I am and that made me do the things that I did. And yet at Nuremberg, you said, I'm guilty. I'm responsible. There's a conflict there. Which is it? Were you, in fact, personally responsible or were you compelled by events? When I, when I made my statement in Nuremberg before the tribunal said, I don't only feel responsible for everything which happened in my ministry, but said I have feel a general responsibility for everything which happened after I entered the government in February 42, uh, then I thought first that it's a kind of a duty. I was ashamed that all the others who were before me in the dock, like Göring or Keidel or Rippentrop, all uh, didn't say a word about responsibility. And in my opinion, there is really a responsibility of a member of a government for everything which happens. He really has to care about what is going on around him. And um, uh, he can't shun away afterwards and say, well, it was an authoritarian system. You were a key minister in a government which chose to set out on this hideous path of destroying the whole Jewish people. You did nothing to try to stop that. Why not? That was a crucial question, uh, which also led me to make this statement, because I couldn't say I knew about what was happening. I was um, shunning away from knowing it. I, I made statements in my two books that, of course, I could have known easily if I only would have tried to know that there were so many remarks of Hitler saying the Jewish people will be annihilated or of uh, some friend who was a Gaul leader who said, never visit a camp in Upper Silesia, there terrible things are happening. He there. said those things to you? He said it to me. And what did yes. you think he meant? Well, it was a warning not, not to go there, and I didn't, I, I didn't go there, of course. And, but uh, I, in this moment, I, I should have asked him, of course. I should have, what you, do you mean? You must have wondered about it. Yeah, I should have asked. Of course, I was shocked. I should have asked him, and I didn't. And this was typical for my whole attitude in the whole time of Hitler, that I didn't ask questions. You had no focused feelings about that at all. You had seen the burned synagogues. You must have seen the Star of David chalked on the walls and the anti-Jewish slogans. Did you never think to yourself, why is he doing this? Where is it going to lead us? Practically not. Um, and it would be no lesson for history if I would say, well, I did, I felt pity or I felt, uh, I felt ashamed of it. Um, of course, that should have been my reaction, but it was not my reaction. My reaction was, I'm an architect, 
I care about my architectural shop and what is happening around me, I close my eyes. You must understand that for many people it's extremely difficult to believe that you didn't know. If I would be in the, in the, uh, I would be in the position of another person, I wouldn't believe it myself. But um, I'm studying hard because it's really uh, very, very bad on me, the whole problem. And I'm just reading, which is a terrible thing to read, everything I can get of uh, reports of concentration camp inmates. And this is what is the burden on me still nowadays, and which I never get, will get rid of it. What sustains you now? What keeps you going through, for example, this hideous research into the camps? Where does the moral strength come from? In fact, my family and my friends, they say, stop it. Uh, you are now 71 and you should uh, have your good, easy life and do it uh, in the easy way. But I can't. It's kind of a trauma, you know, a traumatism which is in inside me. And uh, to, um, to be occupied with those things gives me, strangely enough, more relief than, uh, than a burden. And so it is when I am trying to get in a good contact with Jewish people. And uh, I sometimes I succeed. And um, um, this also helps me to get a little bit rid of my traumatism. How do you find the response when you try to make contact with Jewish people? Mm. I have not the feelings that they are hateful. They just want to know how it happened and what we can learn out of this terrible uh, lesson. You have mentioned several times during our two conversations the importance of the lesson. What is the lesson? Um, I think it is necessary to be aware that the freedom of public opinion isn't suppressed. One of Albert Speer's acquaintances now is the legendary Nazi hunter of Vienna, Simon Wiesenthal. And Wiesenthal told me he believes Speer. He said, I have very warm feelings about that man, which is a sentiment that many Jews could never share about Speer or any other ex-Nazi. And indeed, unhappily for some Jews and Gentiles alike about the German people. There's not much left now of the Berlin of Hitler and Speer. A few lamp standards designed by the promising young architect are still there. And back in the 30s, when the cadences of the Third Reich were striking terror into the hearts of honest Germans, Speer came out here to the Grunewald a forest preserve on the outskirts of Berlin, and directed the planting of hundreds of thousands of young trees, part of his plan for the city. Nowadays, from time to time, he comes back here to see how his trees are doing. They are virtually his only tangible monument, and he is virtually the only German who remembers how they got here.